So we'll look at Nehemiah chapter 2 and go to verse 1. We're going to look at uh, what Nehemiah, how he takes this vision now that God has given him. God has given him this vision and he's going to put it into action. Chapter 2 and verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him, I took the wine in his presence. Excuse me, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my forefathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? And check this out. Then I prayed to God, I prayed to the God of heaven, and then I answered the king. Some people call this a popcorn prayer. I mean, here's Nehemiah who has been spending the last four months in prayer and fasting. But now all of a sudden, boom, before he answers the king, he pops up a prayer. See, you've heard that scripture before where it says pray without ceasing. This is the spirit of praying without ceasing. Before, have you ever had a phone call or you're getting ready to make a phone call and the phone call is you're afraid it's not going to be good? It might be a conflict of some sort or somebody that you might be tempted not to answer right, that's time to pray. You know, pray before you make that phone call or before you answer that person. Well, that's what Nehemiah does. He prays to the God of heaven, then he answers the king. Now check out what he, he says. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild the city. Then the king, sitting with the queen beside him, Ask me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. Now check this out. He doesn't stop there. I also said to them, if it pleases the king, I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me with safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, so he'll give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel uh, by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I'll occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of the trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers in Calvary with me. That's a little added bonus, isn't it, Adam? He not only got all of his wish list, but the king threw in a little extra bonus. Look at verse 10. When Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about this, they were very much disturbed about that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. All right? You remember these two guys. Remember their name. They'll come back again into the play, and we'll talk more about that as weeks go by. All right? Let's stop for just a minute. Next Sunday, the 14th, we're going to do something a little different here. We're going to do something a little different. We're going to have a children's worship. Is that right, Jeff? It's next week. Okay. Next week, uh, we're going to have children's worship. Uh, communion, we're going to have communion set up on the tables, each of these tables. Uh, and what we're going to do, so make sure you set it at a table next week. We'll, we'll hopefully have enough set up. And we're going to do communion at, each, communion at each table, intergenerationally. Make sure you have your family gathered around you and so on at each table. Okay. And then the kids are going to do some stuff for worship. So it's going to be a really special Sunday. Okay? Everybody get that? All right, shift back to preaching. All right, here I am again. Um, so let's, let's look at some of the steps that Nehemiah took. Okay? Now, he's going to take this vision that God has given him, that he's received in prayer. He's going to put it to action. And, and first thing we've got to note is that we've got to be patient. We've got to be patient. This is the lesson that God has had to teach me over and over again. And sometimes it's a hard lesson to learn, isn't it? Because we want to run ahead of God, right? We've got it all figured out. We want to get ahead of God and we want to push the agenda, our agenda ahead of God. We need to spend time in God's waiting room. Listen to what Psalm 27 says. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. What needs to be done in your building project that you're already getting ticked off because it's not happening? And again, people have a tendency, well, I prayed and it isn't happening. So prayer must not work. 
God's not on our timetable. He's on his timetable. And so one of the greatest lessons, the first lesson we can learn from Nehemiah in our building project is be patient. Of course, I'd love to see everybody in the city to come see worshiping God on Sunday morning. Kind of an unrealistic goal, and it's not going to happen overnight, but I know that if we will patiently together work, that could happen. That could happen. But we need to be patient. We need to wait for the Lord. We need to be strong and take heart. We got all kinds of battles that we're fighting. Everybody sitting here has a different battle that they're involved in, a different building project. You got to be patient. Spend time in God's waiting room. Nehemiah understood this. He fasted for and prayed for four months. One could say, if you're looking at that, let's say you're a friend of Nehemiah's. Nehemiah shared this with you. Now four months is going by. Nehemiah, what are you waiting for? Nothing's happening, Nehemiah. And what would Nehemiah's answer be? Well, yeah, something's happening. God is making things happen. He is arranging things so that they will happen according to his schedule, not mine. Nehemiah didn't push it. From the first day that he heard from his friends, couldn't he have gone to the king immediately and said, hey, king, look, it, I need this, this, and this, and this. Well, who knows? It might have been that the king, it was on a day like when Michigan, you know, played Michigan State, and Nehemiah was a Michigan fan, and he had been really ticked off, and he said, Nehemiah, no way. I know that's a crazy illustration, isn't it, Jay? But do you get the point? He might have had a bad day. His camel might have blown out a shoe or something. You don't know. You see? But there, there, it wasn't the right time. Jesus came and said, when? At the right time. Why did Jesus come at the time that he came? Because it was the right time. Folks, this is a huge one with all of us. And, but Nehemiah wasn't inactive during that time. He was praying the whole time. His spiritual radar was on. His eyes and his ears were attuned. He was ready so that when God showed him, now's the time, he could then take the next step. This vision that he had was long-term. And yeah, there's a temptation to get ahead of God and make something happen while we're waiting. But no, here's what he was doing during that time. He was praying passionately. Nehemiah was sure that God was calling him to this mission. He was sure that somehow this king of Persia was going to play a very large role in it. And here's another thing he did. He served where he was. He's this cupbearer dude, right? To the king. He didn't like quit his job and go do something else. He stayed where he was. And why is it that he was at this place? How is it that, by the way, how was it that Nehemiah got to be the cupbearer? And it just so happens that God gave him this vision. Are, are you connecting with me on this? You know, I've been watching my sermon, so I'm realizing something. Sometimes, as I play it back, I've already thought some things through, but I didn't speak them out. Okay? So I, I, I'm... Help me, I want to complete the thought. And you got to give me feedback. Are you catching this? That here's Nehemiah, who knows where he started in life, but somehow through a certain set of circumstances, some which were good, some which were maybe he didn't enjoy very much, but somehow he ended up as this very important person in the presence and the hearing and the confidentiality and the trust of the king of the world at that time. Does that remind you of another Bible passage, another Bible character who happened to be in such a place at such a time? Esther, exactly, Sammy. And the Bible says there, who knows but what you were called for such a time as this. And so you are right now where God wants you to be. You say, well, I don't want to be here. Think about the implications of that statement. If it is in fact true that God has you right where he is, needs you to be, who am I to say, I don't want to be here, God? Am I not then in rebellion to God's fuller vision and will for my life and my purpose in life? You say, but I don't like it here. I don't think Job liked it too much when he was in his station in life, did he? No, he didn't. And I'm not saying that to somehow make light of the current struggle situation that you're in, but I'm just praying that you would be patient be strong and wait for the Lord because you are exactly where He wants you to fulfill the greater purpose. Did you hear what I said? The greater purpose, which is His purposes in life. Be patient. Don't get ahead of Him. Don't get despondent. Don't be discouraged. He has a plan for you, every single one of us in this room. And so...